Hello, and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we're returning to one of our longest running playlists on the channel, an antitrust epic, in which Epic Games sued Apple for its removal of Fortnite from the app ecosystem after Epic had tried to put forth provisions in Fortnite that allowed players to pay Epic directly instead of paying Apple through its IAP system. Now, Epic sued Apple for a violation of United States antitrust law and a violation of California unfair competition law, but ultimately the district court would find when we last visited this playlist that Epic was in the wrong, that antitrust law was not implicated by the way Apple had conducted itself or organized its iOS ecosystem. Now, as you can imagine, Epic was quick to appeal that particular decision because it was a large loss for them. But Apple also wound up appealing because the court in that particular case had determined that one set of provisions, the anti-steering provisions in the developer license agreement also violated California unfair competition law. So they were going to prohibit Apple from enforcing a prohibition on Epic and other developers' ability to tell customers that they could go outside the App Store ecosystem to purchase things like V-Bucks in the case of Fortnite or other currencies in the case of other games. That injunction ultimately got paused by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals pending the appeals process, all of which happened and was finalized in the last 24 hours. Now that Court of Appeals process is what we're going to go over today, hopefully adding to your understanding of what happened and what didn't, regardless of what you might have seen in headlines or discussion on Twitter or social media. But one person that knows how it went is Tim Sweeney, the CEO of Epic Games, who announced in Twitter forum yesterday that he lost another court verdict, climbed another mountain, the world has come a long way since 2020 when the journey began, with much progress achieved by many people in many nations around the world, and onward we go. So unlike some of the headlines we saw when that district court decision ultimately came down, which you can see in that video, in this particular case, everybody seems to acknowledge that the Circuit Court of Appeals, the Ninth Circuit, held for Apple by not really moving anything much at all. You can see in my thumbnail I say that Apple wins, but predominantly that's because Apple won at the district court level and courts of appeals are very difficult to have move one way or the other from the district court's findings. And so in this case, the court of appeals didn't move in Apple's direction, didn't move in Epic's direction much. And so Epic remains the large loser of this particular litigation, even though the court of appeals didn't really love the way the district court determined what it determined. And we'll talk about all of that as we go through this particular document. This document is 91 pages long, so I'm going to be doing my best to summarize and reading only the most salient parts of it for you. But it's important to note a couple of things. One, we're here on the summary page. This is a three-judge panel, Thomas, Smith, and McShane. And the actual opinion is going to be written by Smith with a dissent by Thomas. Now, this summary here that we see on the first page is something that I've seen discussed on the internet and that a number of people seem to be a little bit confused by. So we're going to look at the language here and explain what they are saying. But we're also going to note in the footnote that the summary constitutes no part of the opinion. It was prepared by court staff. It is just a kind of Cliff Notes version of what the court said as determined by a non-judge or justice in this particular case and has been provided for us to better understand the opinion without reading the full 91 pages. Not really an issue for us, but it's worth noting that this paragraph that we're about to read that some are claiming says something that it doesn't is not actually what the court decided upon. So this summary reads as follows. The panel affirmed in part and reversed in part the district court's judgment, which doesn't tell us much. They agreed with some of it. They agreed with uh, a lot of it, as a matter of fact, but they didn't agree with all of it. After a bench trial against Epic Games on its Sherman Ant Act claims for restraint of trade, tying, and monopoly maintenance against Apple Inc., in favor of Epic on its claim under California's unfair competition law, against Epic on Apple's claim for breach of contract, and against Apple on its claim for attorney fees. So this sentence, although it's a little bit tricky to read, is just designed to tell you what the bench trial actually determined, not what this Circuit Court of Appeals is determining. So this is trying to summarize what the bench trial was, what the district court found, which is against Epic on its antitrust claims, in favor of Epic on its California unfair competition law claims, that's the anti-steering provision claims, against Epic on Apple's claim for breach of contract because they did in fact breach their contract, and against Apple on its claim for attorney's fees. The panel affirmed, so they agreed with all of these determinations, except for the district court's ruling respecting attorney's fees where it reversed and remanded for further proceedings. So basically, if we just looked at this paragraph, we could say Epic lost everything that it was looking to appeal and Apple also won one portion of its appeal, which is that it wants attorney fees to be paid for the litigation it has had to undergo because Epic did this contract breach. 
This particular court, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, finds that Apple probably does have a right to those attorney's fees, but it has to be remanded to the district court for determination. Epic had won that at the district court level. They no longer have won that as of this particular finding. But it doesn't say that the circuit court has determined these things against Epic on its Sherman Act claims in favor of Epic on its claim under California unfair competition law. Those were all district court determinations. It's just the panel agrees with them, not that they're separately determined. The panel explained that when Apple opened the iPhone to third-party app developers, it created a walled garden rather than an open ecosystem. Epic alleged that Apple acted unlawfully by restricting app distribution on iOS devices to Apple's App Store, requiring in-app purchases on iOS devices to use Apple's in-app payment processor, and limiting the ability of app developers to communicate the availability of alternative payment options to iOS device users. So those are three areas that are identified in this summary as potential problems with the way Apple conducts its business. These restrictions were imposed under the Developer Programming Program Licensing Agreement, DPLA, which developers were required to sign in order to distribute apps to iOS users. The district court rejected Epic's Sherman Act Section 1 and 2 claims challenging the first and second restrictions. That's restricting app distribution on iOS devices and uh, requiring in-app purchases on iOS devices. So that's distribution and IAP. Principally on the factual grounds that Epic failed to propose viable, less restrictive alternatives to Apple restrictions. We'll talk about that. The district court concluded that the third restriction was unfair pursuant to the California unfair competition law and enjoined Apple from enforcing it against any developer. The district court held that Epic breached its contract with Apple but was not obligated to pay Apple's attorney fees. On Epic's appeal, the panel affirmed the district court's denial of antitrust liability and its corresponding rejection of Epic's illegality defense to Apple's breach of contract counterclaim. So Epic basically acknowledged that they were breaching the contract, but said that it was okay to breach the contract because the contract was illegal. Once the court found that the co contract was not illegal because it didn't violate these antitrust laws, then Epic's illegality defense didn't hold anymore. Epic did breach the contract and they admitted that. The panel held that the district court erred as a matter of law in defining the relevant antitrust market and in holding that a non-negotiated contract of adhesion, such as the DPLA, falls outside the scope of Sherman Act Section 1. But those errors were harmless, which is a particular term of legal art, meaning that it didn't change what the ultimate disposition of the case would be, not that it didn't exist. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. The panel held that independent of the district court's errors, Epic failed to establish as a factual matter its proposed market definition and the existence of any substantially less restrictive alternative means for Apple to accomplish the pro-competitive justification supporting iOS's walled garden ecosystem. So the rule of reason, which is what most antitrust analysis takes place under, basically has this multi-step branching process in which the plaintiff, in this case Epic, has to establish that what the other party, Apple, is doing is anti-competitive and then if it is anti-competitive, the other party gets a chance to say it's pro-competitive for another reason that is not the anti-competitive one. And then the court kind of balances it and the plaintiff has to propose a less restrictive means of getting the same pro-competitive benefits that the other party wants as part of the process. On Apple's cross appeal, the panel affirmed as to the district court's UCL ruling in favor of Epic, holding that the district court did not clearly err in finding that Epic was injured, err as a matter of law when applying California's flexible liability standards, or abuse its discretion when fashioning equitable relief. Reversing in part, the panel held that the district court erred when it ruled that Apple was not entitled to attorney's fees pursuant to the DPLA's indemnification provision. So in this particular paragraph, they say Apple does not get rid of the injunction. They're still not gonna be allowed to do their anti-steering provisions within their DPLA, but they are going to be entitled to attorney's fees, or it would seem so, that's being remanded to the district court for final determination. Concurring in part and dissenting in part, Judge Thomas, wrote that he fully agreed with the majority that the district court properly granted Epic injunctive relief on his California UCL claims. Judge Thomas also fully agreed that the district court properly rejected Epic's illegality defenses to the DPLA, but that contrary to the district court's decision, the DPLA did require Epic to pay attorney's fees for its breach. On the federal claims, Judge Thomas also agreed that the district court erred in defining the relevant market and erred when it held that a non-negotiated contract of adhesion falls outside the scope of Sherman Act Section 1. Unlike the majority, however, Judge Thomas would not conclude that those errors were harmless because they related to threshold analytical steps and affected Epic's substantial rights. We'll talk about this as well, but basically what the court is going to say is even though the district court got that wrong, the district court's wrongful determination did not affect its final judgment because it nevertheless engaged in a rule of reason analysis as if it had found that the threshold had been passed. That's one of the reasons that when we read through those those trial court documents, we see courts say, 
we think this is the way it is, but we'll pretend it isn't and we'll go through the analysis anyways to survive appeal in the manner that this court did in this particular instance. Then we get a whole list of counsel. It goes for pages and pages. Lots of lawyers involved on this. That's why those legal fees are going to be important for Apple to win. And then we get to Judge Smith's opinion. Epic Games sued Apple pursuant to the Sherman Act and California's unfair competition law. Epic contends that Apple acted unlawfully by restricting app distribution on iOS devices to Apple's App Store, requiring in-app purchases on iOS devices to use Apple's in-app payment processor, and limiting the ability of app developers to communicate the availability of alternative payment options to iOS device users. Apple countersued for breach of contract and indemnification for its attorney fees arising from this litigation. After a 16-day bench trial involving dozens of witnesses and 900 exhibits, the district court rejected Epic's Sherman Act claims challenging the first and second of the above restrictions. Now, that sentence is important because that's one of the reasons that the Court of Appeals standard is so high. You might be wondering why do Court of Appeals require so much extra evidence to actually change what the district court found? That's because they aren't getting the full bench trial and the 900 exhibits. They're looking at things primarily from an area of law rather than fact. And so they will defer to the fact finder, in this case, the court, in many, many instances. It's one of the reasons why my colleagues like to say appeals are for losers principally on the factual grounds that Epic failed to propose viable, less restrictive alternatives to Apple's restrictions. The court then concluded that the third restriction is unfair pursuant to the UCL and enjoyed Apple from enforcing it against any developer. Finally, it held that Epic breached a contract with Apple but was not obligated to pay Apple's attorney's fees. We affirm the district court, except for its ruling respecting attorney's fees, where we reverse and remand for further proceedings. Apple is a multi-trillion dollar technology company that of particular relevance here sells desktop and laptop computers, smartphones, and tablets. In 2007, Apple entered and revolutionized the smartphone market with the iPhone, offering consumers through a then novel multi-touch interface access to email, the internet, and several pre-installed native apps that Apple had developed itself. Shortly after the iPhone debut, Apple decided to move on from its native apps only approach and open the iPhones and later iPads operating system, iOS, to third party apps. This approach created a symbiotic relationship. Apple provides app developers with a substantial consumer base, and Apple benefits from increased consumer appeal given the ever-expanding pool of iOS apps. Despite this general symbiosis, there is periodic friction between Apple and app developers. That is because Apple, when it opened the iPhone to third-party developers, did not create an entirely open ecosystem in which developers and users could transact freely without any mediation. Instead, Apple created a walled garden in which Apple plays a significant curating role. Developers can distribute their apps to iOS devices only through Apple's App Store, and after Apple has reviewed an app to ensure that it meets certain security, privacy, content, and reliability requirements. Developers are also required to use Apple's in-app payment processor, IAP, for any purchases that occur within their apps. Subject to some exceptions, Apple collects a 30% commission on initial app purchases and subsequent in-app purchases. Epic is a multi-billion dollar video game company with three primary lines of business, each of which figures into various aspects of the party's appeals. First. Epic is a video game developer, best known for the immensely popular Fortnite, which has over 400 million users worldwide across gaming consoles, computers, smartphones, and tablets. Epic monetizes Fortnite using a freemium model. The game is free to download, but a user can purchase certain content within the game, ranging from game modes to cosmetic upgrades for the user's character. Fortnite is also notable as one of the first major video games to feature cross-play, cross-progression, and cross-wallet. This cross-functionality gives the estimated 32-52% to 52 of Fortnite users who own multiple gaming devices flexibility regarding where and how they play, as well as on which devices they make in-game purchases. Second, Epic is the parent company of a gaming software developer. Epic International, a Swiss subsidiary, licenses Unreal Engine to game developers. Unreal Engine offers developers a suite of tools to create three-dimensional content. In return, Epic International receives 5% of a licensee's gross revenue from a product developed using Unreal Engine after the product generates $1 million in revenue. Although Unreal Engine is not on Apple's App Store, Epic International does offer several complimentary apps there. Unreal Remote and Live Link Face, for example, allow users to capture live action footage and then view it on Unreal Engine. Thus, Epic, through its subsidiary, continues to be affected by the policies that govern the App Store. That's going to be important for one of Apple's complaints in this particular issue. Third, Epic is a video game publisher and distributor. It offers the Epic Game Store as a game transaction platform on PC computers and Macs and seeks to do the same for iOS devices. As a distributor, Epic makes a game available for download on the Epic Game Store and covers the direct cost of distribution. In exchange, Epic receives a 12% commission, a below-cost commission that sacrifices short-term profitability to build market share. That's also important because it's the way the court says we're not going to hold that 12% as the true market cost 
of running one of these platforms. They're saying specifically that that's below what would actually take to run one of these systems. They're doing it to get users into their ecosystem. Through the Epic Game Store, Epic is a would-be competitor of Apple for iOS game distribution and a direct competitor when it comes to games that feature cross-platform functionality like Fortnite. Apple creates its walled garden ecosystem through both technical and contractual means. To distribute apps to iOS users, a developer may pay a flat $99 fee and execute the developer programming licensing agreement. The DPLA is a contract of adhesion. Out of the millions of registered iOS developers, only a handful have convinced Apple to modify its terms. Adhesion here meaning that, like many of the things that you might otherwise see on the web as a contract, it's not offered for negotiation. You don't redline it and send back your preferred terms. You sign it or you don't. Apple doesn't care. And so that's a contract of adhesion. And one of the things the district court found was that a contract of adhesion comes outside the Sherman Antitrust Act. And that's one of the things that the Ninth Circuit here is going to push back against. By agreeing to the DPLA, developers unlock access to Apple's vast consumer base, the over 1 billion users that make up about 15% of global smartphone users. They also receive tools that facilitate the development of iOS apps. In essence, Apple uses the DPLA to license its IP to developers in exchange for a $99 fee and an ongoing 30% commission on developers' iOS revenue. That's key because this is one of the fighting points that Apple and Epic have as a kind of philosophical matter. That is that Tim Sweeney at Epic appears, by virtue of his tweets and other social media presence, to believe that Apple isn't entitled to virtually any money for giving Epic access to the iOS ecosystem and number of people that are playing on iPhones or iPads or Macintosh computers. Instead, he feels that this entire 30% commission is a tax on that access and it's unearned completely. The court here, by determining that it was, in essence, a license of Apple IP to developers in exchange for this fee, makes it a much more reasonable kind of sounding contract than what Tim Sweeney would propose this be described as. The DPLA contains the three provisions that give rise to this lawsuit and were mentioned in the introduction. First, developers can distribute iOS apps only through the App Store, the distribution restriction. Second, developers must use Apple's IAP to process in-app payments, the IAP requirement. Third, developers cannot communicate out-of-app payment methods through certain mechanisms such as in-app links, the anti-steering provision. In 2010, Epic agreed to the DPLA. Over the next few years, Epic released three games for iOS, each of which Apple promoted at major events. In 2015, however, Epic began objecting to Apple's walled garden approach. Epic CEO Tim Sweeney argued in an email seeking a meeting with Apple senior leadership that it doesn't seem tenable for Apple to be the sole arbiter of expression and commerce for iOS users and explain that Epic runs a competing game transaction platform that it would love to eventually offer on iOS. But nothing came of this email. In 2020, 10 years later, Epic renewed the DPLA with Apple, but sought a side letter modifying its terms. In particular, Epic desired to offer iOS users alternatives for distribution and in-app payment processing. Apple flatly rejected this offer, stating we understand this might be in Epic's financial interest, but Apple strongly believes these rules are vital to the health of the Apple platform and carry enormous benefits for both consumers and developers. The guiding principle of the App Store is to prove a safe, secure, and reliable experience for users. Once Apple rejected its offer, Epic kicked into full gear an initiative called Project Liberty, a two-part plan it had been developing since 2019 to undermine Apple's control over software distribution and payment processing on iOS devices, as well as Google's influence over Android devices. Project Liberty coupled a media campaign against Apple and Google with a software update expressly designed to circumvent Apple's IAP restriction. On the media campaign side, Epic lowered the price of Fortnite's in-app purchases on all platforms but Apple's App Store and Google's Google Play Store. It formed an advocacy group, the Coalition for App Fairness, tasking it with generating continuous media pressure on Apple and Google, and it ran advertisements portraying Apple and Google as the bad guys, standing in the way of Epic's attempt to pass cost savings onto consumers. On the IAP circumvention side, Epic submitted a Fortnite software update, which Epic calls a hot fix to Apple for review containing undisclosed code that once activated would enable Fortnite users to make in-game purchases without Apple's IAP. Unaware of this undisclosed code, Apple approved the update and it was made available to iOS users. Shortly thereafter, Epic activated the undisclosed code. Shortly thereafter, Epic activated the undisclosed code and opened its IAP alternative to users. That same day, Apple became aware of the hotfix and removed Fortnite from the App Store. Apple informed Epic that it had two weeks to cure its breaches of the DPLA, or otherwise Apple would terminate Epic Games' developer account. Only three days after Apple removed Fortnite from the App Store, Epic filed a 62-page complaint against Apple in the Northern District of California seeking a temporary restraining order, reinstating Fortnite and enjoining Apple from terminating Epic's iOS developer account. 
The district court granted Epic's prayer in part and denied it in part, leaving Fortnite off the App Store, but temporarily preventing Apple from taking any adverse action regarding Epic's developer account. After the TRO expired, Apple terminated Epic's developer account. The court then issued a preliminary injunction preventing Apple from terminating the developer accounts of Epic subsidiaries, including Epic International, and scheduled a bench trial on an expedited basis, with trial beginning just about eight months after Epic filed its complaint. Yep, that's expedited, folks. Epic brought claims for permanent injunctive relief pursuant to the Sherman Act and the UCL. Epic's requested relief, though somewhat vague, would essentially convert iOS into an entirely open platform. Developers would be free to distribute apps through any means they wish and use any in-app payment processor they chose. Taken together, this relief would create a pathway for developers to bypass Apple's 30% commission altogether, though Epic made open-ended assurances at trial that its relief would allow Apple to collect a commission, just not in the manner that the DPLA establishes. Apple brought counterclaims for breach of contract and indemnification for its attorney's fees related to this litigation. After a 16-day bench trial, the district court issued a 180-page order, which you can see on this playlist, detailing its findings of facts and conclusions of law. Number one, market definition. The district court began its analysis by defining the relevant market for Epic's Sherman Act claims. Epic proposed two single brand markets, the aftermarkets for iOS app distribution and iOS in-app payment solutions derived from a foremarket for smartphone operating systems. Apple, by contrast, proposed the market for all video game transactions, whether they occur on a smartphone, a gaming console, or elsewhere. The district court ultimately found a market between those the parties proposed, mobile game transactions, i.e. game transactions on iOS and Android smartphones, and tablets. Compared to Epic's proposed aftermarkets, the district court's relevant market was both broader and narrower. Broader in that it declined to focus exclusively on iOS, but narrower in that it considered only video game transactions instead of all app transactions. Compared to Apple's proposed market, the district court's relevant market was narrower, excluding game console and streaming service transactions. The district court rejected Epic's proposed single brand markets on several grounds. So understand, the market definition is super important to an antitrust action because what we're looking for is unusual levels of market control or profitability coming from control of a specific subset of the market. So if you can define it as something that Apple definitely has total control over, like iOS in-app payment solutions, then that's going to largely be a winning argument for you if you're on Team Epic. But if you can name it as all mobile game transactions, clearly Apple doesn't have full control over all mobile game transactions or what they offered, which was all video game transactions. Apple most certainly doesn't have control over all video game transactions. Then Apple is going to be less likely to be found as an antitrust violator in that broader market. So when the court determines that they're going to look at mobile game transactions. That's an important aspect of what they're going to analyze in their ruling. And that's one of the reasons why there's a dissent to this particular Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals opinion. But what Epic was trying to do was establish that Apple has a monopoly power in iOS app distribution and iOS in-app payment solutions as a function of iOS in general. So they were trying to say there's a four market in iOS operating systems and then that results in an aftermarket where you've already purchased into that ecosystem and then Apple controls these aftermarkets for app distribution and payment solutions and that those markets are the ones that we should worry about. And the court declined that on what the Ninth Circuit describes as several grounds. It held that there was no four market for smartphone and tablet operating systems because Apple does not license or sell iOS. The Ninth Circuit is gonna have a big problem with this. More critically, it analyzed Epic's aftermarkets in the alternative and found a failure of proof. Epic presented no evidence regarding whether consumers unknowingly lock themselves into Apple's app distribution and IP restrictions when they buy iOS devices. A natural experiment facilitated by Apple's removal of Fortnite from the App Store showed that iOS Fortnite users switched about 80% of their pre-removal iOS spending to other platforms, suggesting substitutionality between the App Store and other game transaction platforms. The district court also rejected Apple's relevant market definition expert as weakly probative and more interested in the result that would assist his client than in providing any objective ground to assist the court in its decision making. And yeah, we talked about that expert as well. The court really did not like Apple's expert on market definition. Among other flaws, the expert's analysis contradicted his own academic articles on how to analyze two-sided markets, used consumer survey wording that departed from well-established market definition principles, failed to account for holiday season idiosyncrasies, and excluded minors who are an important segment of mobile game purchasers. The district court then turned to Apple's proposed relevant market definition and refined it from all game transactions to mobile game transactions by relying extensively on practical indicia. The district court then rejected Epic's Sherman antitrust claim 
As a threshold matter, the court held that the DPLA was not a contract that fell within the scope of Section 1 because it was a contract of adhesion and not a truly bargained for agreement. It then, in the alternative, applied the rule of reason, the antitrust liability standard applicable to most cases. At step one of the rule of reason, the district court found that Epic proved substantial anti-competitive harms through both direct and indirect evidence. Apple has for years charged a super competitive commission on app store transactions that was set without regard for competition. That commission in turn creates an extraordinarily high operating margin of 75% for app store transactions. Moreover, Apple has market power in the mobile games transactions market evidenced by its 52 to 57% market share and barriers to entry in the form of network effects. Apple uses that market power to prevent would-be competitors like Epic from offering app distribution and payment processing alternatives, reducing innovation in Apple's own investment in the App Store in the process. At step two of the rule of reason, the district court found that Apple established non-pretextual, they're not lying, legally cognizable pro-competitive rationales for its app distribution and IAP restrictions. So Epic, when they comment on this particular ruling, are going to focus on the fact that the circuit court is describing what the district court found and is going to ultimately back them up as anti-competitive harms from Apple's decisions, but does not really talk about the fact that under the rule of reason, Apple also proved, according to the same court, that there were pro-competitive rationales, reasons for operating in the way that they did. And this makes sense if you know how Apple works, if you know how any game console works. Basically, what the court is saying is that a walled garden is anti-competitive. You built a wall and you are keeping certain of the consumers that opted into that walled garden within that garden, but they are going to allow for a fact that hey, a walled garden can have pro-competitive justifications. As we will see, it provides Apple with the ability to product differentiate across its product line against people that have a purely open system, and that's going to be dispositive to the court. The district court credited Apple's rationale that its restrictions seek to enhance consumer appeal and differentiate Apple products by improving iOS security and privacy. It also partially accepted Apple's rationale that the restrictions are a means of being compensated for third party developers use of its intellectual property, crediting it generally, but rejecting it with respect to the 30% commission rate specifically. At step three of the rule of reason, the district court rejected Epic's proposed less restrictive alternatives as severely underdeveloped. As a purported LRA to Apple's app distribution restriction, Epic primarily advanced a notarization model based on Apple's approach to security on the Mac operating system. On Mac OS, Apple does not mandate an exclusive distribution channel as it does on iOS, nor does Apple condition distribution of an app on first submitting that app to Apple for review. But when a developer chooses to forego submitting an app to Apple, that app, regardless of how it is distributed to Mac users, will carry a warning that Apple has not scanned it for malware. Critically, the Mac OS notarization model does not contain a layer of human review, as iOS app review does. Given this discrepancy, the district court found that such a model would not be as effective as Apple's current model in achieving Apple's security and privacy goals. It briefly considered whether Apple could close the gap by imposing a security and privacy floor on third-party app stores, but then noted that it is unclear whether doing so would comport with Epic's requested injunctive relief. In any event, the court found that Epic failed to prove the notarization model would accomplish Apple's IP compensation rationale because Epic's requested relief leaves unclear whether Apple can collect licensing fee royalties, and if so, how it would do so. And I want us to focus on this particular question because one of the things that has happened in both the District Court and Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals levels is that the court has found that Apple does in fact have a right and it's a competitive right to go and get some sort of compensation for access to its intellectual property. In this case, its ecosystem, its app store, and everything else. Its user base that owns an iPhone or an iPad. One of the areas that Tim Sweeney is against and a lot of the places that we can see discussed in various articles online are against is the 30% in general. At no point does this court or the court below it determine that the 30% or some percentage isn't owed to Apple. So even if you go around the App Store and the IAP system, it is still something that Apple is entitled to be paid for. It's just that there's an accounting that needs to be done. And we need to remember that as we will see in just a little bit further on in this video. As a purported LRA for the IAP requirement, Epic proposed opening in-app payment processing to competing vendors. The district court again rejected the proposed LRA as not being as effective as Apple's current model in accomplishing its security and privacy goals. More fundamentally, there was little in the record showing how Epic envisioned Apple accomplishing its IP compensation goal through the proposed LRA. Because the court upheld the app distribution restriction, Apple would still be entitled to its 30% commission on in-app purchases within apps downloaded from the App Store. On its own initiative, the district court floated the idea of Apple permitting multiple in-app payment processors while reserving the right to audit developers to ensure compliance with its commission, but it quickly rejected that as an alternative because it would seemingly impose both increased monetary and time costs. These courts are always looking at Apple as the party that is 
entitled to a certain amount of compensation for this access. And that's something that is a fundamental philosophical disagreement between the platform providers and the developers on this particular issue. The district court rejected Epic's Sherman Act claim that Apple ties in-app payment processing to app distribution. It did so on grounds that neither of the purported separate products were actually separate. As a result, it did not decide which liability standard, per se condemnation, or the rule of reason would govern the arrangement's lawfulness. As for Sherman Act Section 2, Monopoly Maintenance, the district court also rejected Epic's claim that Apple monopolized the market for mobile games transactions. Though Apple has significant market power, the court found it to be insufficiently durable given the rapidly changing nature of the market. In any event, the court reiterated its rule of reason analysis to hold that Apple did not maintain its power through anti-competitive conduct. As we've talked about in this space in virtual legality before, for the most part, having monopoly is not itself illegal if you didn't engage in anti-competitive conduct to either get that monopoly or retain that monopoly. So one of the things the courts look at is did you engage in that conduct? Otherwise, we basically want competitors to take large market shares through things like increased quality or lower prices, more efficiencies that are benefiting consumers. That's something that we like. If you're that much better than your competitors and you're getting a huge market share, that's a good thing overall. But if you're doing it through restrictive contracts or in ways that we otherwise find to be illegal, that's a problem for competition, that's a problem for the consumers, and that's when the court will interject. The court then applied the UCL to Apple's anti-steering provision. The court found that Epic is sufficiently injured to seek injunctive relief because Epic is a competing games distributor and would earn additional revenue but for Apple's restrictions. On the merits, the court applied the competitor suit tethering test and consumer suit balancing test and found the anti-steering provision to be unfair pursuant to both. The court concluded that Epic satisfied all the requirements for injunctive relief and the nature of Epic's injury warranted an injunction preventing Apple from enforcing the provision against any developer. Turning to Apple's counterclaims, the district found Epic liable for breach of the DPLA. Epic had stipulated that the Project Liberty hotfix breached the DPLA's IAP requirement, so the only dispute was whether Epic could prove that the contract was illegal, void as against public policy, or unconscionable. The district court rejected each of these affirmative defenses. Finally, the district court rejected Apple's indemnification claim, which asserted Epic was obligated to pay its attorney's fees incurred in this litigation. The DPLA provides that Epic agrees to indemnify and hold harmless from any and all claims, losses, liabilities, damages, taxes, expenses, and costs, including without limitation attorney's fees and court costs, incurred by Apple and arising from or related to Epic's breach of any certification, covenant, obligation, representation, or warranty in the DPLA. Applying a principle of California contract law requiring a clear statement before finding an indemnification clause to apply to disputes between the parties themselves, the district court construed the provision as applicable only to third-party claims. This is one of the main areas the Ninth Circuit is going to disagree with the ultimate determination of the district court on. Following the handing down of the district court's order, the parties timely appealed and cross-appealed. Apple also moved to stay the UCL injunction pending appeal, arguing that Epic lacked standing in light of its developer account termination and that injunctive relief was inappropriate. The district court denied the motion and a panel of our court granted it in part. In an appeal following a bench trial, we review the district court's factual findings for clear error and its conclusion of law de novo. So this is what I was talking about with respect to courts of appeals not otherwise upending district court findings in most circumstances. So what this says in maybe plain English is a little bit strong, but a little bit less legalese is that when we are looking at an appeal of a bench trial, we review the court's factual findings, the facts, for clear error, which is a very high standard, and its conclusions of law de novo from the beginning, without otherwise looking at how they determine these various things. This is one of the reasons why a court of appeals is unlikely to move a district court's findings very far at all. So they will rely on the fact findings of the court under them for, for anything other than clear error, which is going to be very hard to prove based on factual determinations. Now, with respect to conclusions of law, the application of law to the facts that the court found, this court doesn't have to take into account what the district court's reasoning was basically at all. They look at things de novo from the start as new. And so that allows for a court of appeals to change things on a legal basis, but it's not very often going to change things on a fact basis. So whatever the district court found factually is going to hold. And when you find a lot of things in an antitrust case on a fact basis, that means the court of appeals is going to be locked into those findings pretty much all the time. Clear error is a very high standard to reach. On appeal, Epic challenges the district court's Sherman Act and breach of contract rulings. We affirm the district court's denial of antitrust liability and its corresponding rejection of Epic's illegality defense to Apple's breach of contract counterclaim. But the district court erred as a matter of law on several issues. Those errors were harmless, again, meaning that they did not change the ultimate disposition of the case. 
Independent of the district court's errors, Epic failed to establish as a factual matter its proposed market definition and the existence of any substantially less restrictive alternative means for Apple to accomplish the pro-competitive justification supporting iOS's walled garden ecosystem. The district court did not clearly err in finding that Epic was injured as a matter of law when applying California's flexible liability standards or abused its discretion when fashioning equitable relief. So Apple's cross appeal on that is also denied. We're going to enjoin the use of the anti-steering provisions in the DPLA. The district court did, however, err when it held that Apple was not entitled to attorney fees pursuant to the DPLA's indemnification provision. As for market definition, we agree that the district court erred in certain aspects of its market definition analysis, but conclude that those errors were harmless. Despite some threshold errors, the district court proceeded to analyze Epic's evidence pursuant to the proper legal framework and did not clearly err in rejecting Epic's proposed relevant markets. In particular, Epic failed to produce any evidence showing, as our president requires, that consumers are generally unaware of Apple's app distribution and IAP restrictions when they purchase iOS devices. The Sherman Act contains two principal prohibitions. Section 1 targets concerted action, rendering unlawful every contract, combination, or conspiracy in restraint of trade. Section 2 targets independent action, making it unlawful to monopolize or attempt to monopolize or combine or conspire with any other person or persons to monopolize any part of the trade or commerce among the several states. There are two general categories of liability standards for Sherman Act claims. A small group of restraints are unreasonable per se because they always or almost always tend to restrict competition and decrease output. When a per se prohibition applies, we deem a restraint unlawful without any elaborate study of the industry in which it occurs. Most restraints, however, are subject to the rule of reason, a multi-step burden-shifting framework that requires courts to conduct a fact-specific assessment to determine a restraint's actual effect on competition. The rule of reason applies essentially the same, regardless of whether the alleged antitrust violation involves concerted anti-competitive conduct under Section 1 or independent anti-competitive conduct under Section 2. In most, though not all, rule of reason cases, a threshold step is determining the relevant market in which the alleged restraint occurs. We begin our analysis with that market definition. The relevant market for antitrust purposes is the area of effective competition, i.e., the arena within which significant substitution and consumption or production occurs. I think this is very important to understand. The relevant market is the field in which meaningful competition is said to exist. A relevant market contains both a geographic component and a product or service component. A market comprises any grouping of sales whose sellers, if unified by monopolist or a hypothetical cartel, could profitably raise prices above a competitive level. If the sales of other producers could substantially constrain the price increasing ability of that monopolist or hypothetical cartel, these other producers must be included in the market. To conduct this inquiry, courts must determine which products have a reasonable interchangeability of use or sufficient cross elasticity of demand with each other. So understand setting a market means if there are ways to get around putting all of the market participants together and them increasing prices, then that market isn't a good definition because that ways to get around should be included in the original market. We're hypothesizing that all those market participants are one body. And so we look to substitutability as one of the main ways to understand whether our market is too narrow. This is important to Epic and Apple. It's also important to some of the other things we discuss on this channel like Microsoft and Activision. Often this inquiry involves empirical evidence in the form of a SNP test. That analysis echoes Rebel Oil and uses past consumer demand data and or consumer survey responses to determine whether a hypothetical monopolist could profitably impose a small, significant, non-transitory increase in price above a competitive level. As we have previously summarized in this analysis, at each step, if consumers would respond to a SNP by making purchases outside the proposed market definition, thereby rendering the SNP unprofitable, the proposed market definition is too narrow. Courts also consider several practical indicia that the Supreme Court highlighted in the Brown Shoe case. One, industry or public recognition of the market as a separate economic entity. Two, the product's peculiar characteristics and uses. Three, unique production facilities. Four, distinct customers. Five, distinct prices. Six, sensitivity of price changes. And seven, specialized vendors. So you can look overall at how the real world looks at a particular proposed market and see if that market makes sense as definition as well. In some instances, one brand of a product can constitute a separate market, and here's the Kodak case. In Kodak, the Supreme Court considered the question of whether a lack of market power in the fore market, photocopier machines generally, categorically precludes a finding of market power in the aftermarket, replacement parts for, and servicing of Kodak brand photocopiers, which Kodak had allegedly achieved by contractually limiting customers to Kodak provided parts and services. The Supreme Court rejected Kodak's invitation to impose an across-the-board rule because it was not convinced that the rule would always hold true. The Supreme Court thus folded aftermarkets into the framework of assessing markets generally, 
evaluating cross-elasticity of demand to determine whether a hypothetical monopolist could profitably charge a super competitive price. So if, if the app store were absolutely ridiculous in pricing or availability, would you move from the iOS ecosystem to the Android ecosystem in this particular question? Explaining its skepticism of the factual assumption underlying Codex's proposed categorical rule, the court reasoned that significant information costs and switching costs could create a less responsive connection between aftermarket prices and foremarket sales. Said another way, if you didn't have enough information to understand exactly what it was going to cost you in the aftermarket, then you wouldn't have reason to move from iOS to Android, or in this case from Kodak to one of Kodak's competitors. So that's going to create a less interesting cross-elasticity question, and you are going to be able to have potential monopolies and super competitive pricing in that aftermarket because the foremarket competition is not controlling your ability to un engage in these various things at that aftermarket level. That is, these conditions might lock in unknowing customers such that competition in the foremarket cannot discipline competition in the aftermarkets, meaning a hypothetical monopolist could price its aftermarket products at super competitive level without a substantial number of customers substituting to other products. In the parentheses here, Kodak's single brand aftermarket requires high switching costs, high information costs, and substantial ability to exploit ignorant customers. In NewCal, we considered how to square Kodak with our prior holding in Forsyth that contractual obligations are generally not a cognizable source of market power. We reasoned that the critical distinction between Kodak on the one hand and Forsyth on the other is that the Kodak customers did not knowingly enter a contract that gave Kodak the exclusive right to prove parts and services for the life of the equipment. But otherwise, the simple purchase of a Kodak brand equipment was not functionally equivalent to the signing of their contractual agreement, limiting aftermarket choices. Kodak thus differed markedly from Forsyth, which involved medical insurance policyholders who entered into insurance contracts with Humana, knowing that certain hospitals would carry higher deductibles and copayments than others. Our knowledge-based distinction in NewCal flowed directly from the Supreme Court's emphasis in Kodak on a defendant's ability to use not generally known aftermarket restrictions to exploit unsophisticated consumers. And as in Kodak, we made sure to emphasize that the aftermarket's inquiry does not end as soon as a plaintiff checks the Kodak-based boxes related to consumer knowledge, information costs, and switching costs. Even when a submarket is an Eastman Kodak market, though, it must bear the practical indicia of an independent economic entity in order to qualify as a cognizable submarket under brown shoe. In sum, to establish a single brand aftermarket, a plaintiff must show the challenged aftermarket restrictions are not generally known when consumers make their foremarket purchase, significant information costs prevent accurate life cycle pricing, significant monetary or non-monetary switching costs exist, and general market definition principles regarding cross-elasticity of demand do not undermine the proposed single brand market. So the courts here are reluctant to frame a single product provided by a single producer as a market monopoly because otherwise every single product is basically monopolized by the producer that has the intellectual property rights to it. And that's a problem because that's the way the economy functions. Here, they look at Kodak, they look at some of the other cases that they have as precedent, and they say what we're really worried about is that if you're competing in a foremarket, the aftermarket has to be known to consumers, or if it's not generally known, that aftermarket could act as an independent market entity and allow you to manipulate consumers and get those super competitive prices. So what we're really interested in, and the district court looked at this in this particular case, and the Ninth Circuit looks at it here, is do consumers who purchase an iPhone know that the app store is the exclusive means of getting apps on that iPhone and the other restrictions that Apple imposes on its developers, or do they care? Standard of review. We review relevant market definitions as fact findings reversible only if the evidence compels a conclusion contrary to the fact finder's verdict. Where a plaintiff asserts a Kodak style single brand aftermarket, it bears the burden of rebutting the economic presumption that consumers make a knowing choice to restrict their aftermarket options when they decide in the initial competitive market to enter a contract. So in this particular case, we're going to assume that consumers know what they're getting into when they purchase an iPhone uh, and not the opposite. With these legal principles in mind, we now turn to Epic's arguments that the district court committed legal error when one, it held the market can never be defined around a product that the defendant does not license or sell, two, required lack of consumer awareness to establish a Kodak style market, three, purportedly required a change in policy to establish a Kodak style market, and four, required Epic to establish the magnitude of switching costs. We agree with Epic on its first argument and to the extent the district court did impose a change in policy requirement on the third argument. Those are highlighted here in green. But we reject Epic's second and fourth arguments as squarely foreclosed by Kodak and NewCal. First, the district court erred by imposing a categorical rule that an antitrust market can never relate to a product that is not licensed or sold. Here are smartphone operating systems. 
So at the district court level, the determination was made that because Apple doesn't sell the iOS, the iOS cannot be the foremarket to two separate aftermarkets. To begin with, says the Ninth Circuit, this categorical rule flouts the Supreme Court's instruction that courts should conduct market definition inquiries based not on formalistic distinctions, but on actual market realities. Moreover, the district court's rule is difficult to square with decisions defining a product market to include vertically integrated firms that self-provision the relevant product but make no outside sales. For example, the DC Circuit in Microsoft noted that Apple had not had a not insignificant share of worldwide sales of operating systems, even though Apple did not sell or license macOS, but instead only included it in its own Mac computers. While the Microsoft court ultimately excluded macOS from its market, it did so on a fact-based substitutability grounds, not the categorical grounds that the district court used here. Finally, the district court's rule overlooks that there may be markets where companies offer a product to one side of the market for free, but profit in other ways, such as by collecting consumer data or generating ad revenue. See, for example, FTC versus Facebook. Finding FTC plausibly alleged a market of personal social networks, even though all are provided free to charge of users. Second, the district court did not err when it required Epic to produce evidence regarding a lack of consumer knowledge of Apple's app distribution and IAP restrictions. Such a requirement comes directly from Kodak and NuCal. The former stated that it is crucial that aftermarket restrictions are not generally known. The latter placed the burden on the plaintiff to rebut the economic presumption that consumers make a knowing choice to restrict their aftermarket options. So Epic has the burden of showing that consumers don't make their decision on the understanding of these app distribution and IP restrictions, and they didn't provide, I don't think, any information on that, which is what the court found. Third, Epic argues that the district court erred by holding that a plaintiff can establish a Kodak-style aftermarket only if it shows that the defendant adopted its aftermarket restrictions after some portion of consumers purchased their foremarket durable goods. Had the district court actually imposed such an absolute change in policy requirement, it would have erred. As explained above, Kodak and NuCal require a showing of lack of consumer awareness regarding aftermarket restrictions. And you can tell from the had the district court actually imposed kind of language that the Ninth Circuit ultimately doesn't believe that the court did do that. A change in policy is, of course, one way of doing so. A consumer cannot knowingly agree to a restriction that did not exist at the time of the foremarket transaction. But it is not the exclusive means of doing so. Indeed, Kodak itself contemplated that some sophisticated high-volume consumers would be able to accurately lifecycle price goods in the foremarket. Such lifecycle pricing would be impossible if those consumers were unaware that they would be restricted to certain vendors in that aftermarket. But contrary to Epic's assertion, we do not read the district court's order as running counter to these principles. The district court explained that the other circuits have aligned with the contours of NuCal regarding knowledge and or post-purchase policy changes, and that the breadth of antitrust law requires that a restriction must not have been sufficiently disclosed to consumers. It then quoted the operative language from NuCal that focuses on a lack of knowledge, not the necessity of a policy change. Finally, it examined the record to find neither a change in policy nor proof that the iOS device purchases are unaware of the distribution and IAP restrictions. The district court appropriately treated a change in policy as one, but not the exclusive way of establishing Kodak and NuCal's general lack of knowledge requirement. Fourth, the district court did not err when it required Epic to produce evidence about the magnitude of switching costs. Kodak explicitly requires that switching costs, whether monetary or non-monetary, to be significant. This showing need not be extensive. Among other things, a plaintiff can just point to the heavy initial outlay of the foremarket good and brand-specific purchases. By requiring such a showing, the district court was simply fulfilling its Kodak obligation of ensuring that switching costs are, in fact, significant. We now turn to the main thrust of Epic's market definition argument, that it is entitled as a factual matter to a finding in favor of its proposed aftermarkets. Though Epic attempts to avoid the clear error label, its argument requires it to carry the heavy burden on appeal of showing that the district court clearly erred in finding that Epic failed to show a lack of general consumer awareness regarding Apple's restrictions on iOS distribution and payment processing, two, Epic failed to show significant switching costs, and three, the empirical evidence in the record and the brown shoe practical indicia support a market of mobile gaming transactions and not Epic's iOS-specific aftermarkets. Beginning with the first prong, Epic had the burden of showing a lack of consumer awareness, whether through a change in policy or otherwise especially in light of the district court's finding that Apple has maintained the same general rules for distribution and payment processing since the App Store's early days, it did not clearly err in concluding that Epic failed to prove a lack of consumer awareness through a change of policy. Nor did the district court clearly err in finding that Epic otherwise failed to establish a lack of awareness. Indeed, the district court squarely found there is no evidence in the record demonstrating that consumers are unaware that the App Store is the sole means of digital distribution on the iOS platform. Because of this failure of proof on the first prong of Epic's Kodak NuCal showing, we need not reach and do not express any view regarding the other factual grounds on which the district court rejected Epic's single brand markets. Moreover, the district court's finding on Kodak NuCal's consumer unawareness requirement renders harmless its rejection of Epic's proposed aftermarkets on the legally erroneous basis that Apple does not license or sell iOS as a standard product. So here, the Ninth Circuit believes that the court got this wrong. Right, the, the district court said 
Because they don't sell iOS, it can't be a foremarket that gives rise to aftermarkets. The Ninth Circuit thinks that's wrong, but because the district court went further in the alternative and actually looked at the fact that the aftermarkets weren't proven by Epic, that Epic never showed that consumers weren't aware of how the aftermarkets operate, then the problem that they had in not allowing the iOS to be the foremarket is otherwise legally moot. This is going to be a disagreement in the dissent, but I think that the majority has the right of it in this particular case. As a result, Epic cannot establish its proposed aftermarkets on the record before our court, even after the district court's erroneous reasoning is corrected. In his partial dissent, our colleague Judge Thomas disagrees with our conclusion that the error discussed in this section is harmless. First, Judge Thomas contends that we lack any direct authority for this proposition. While we do not have a codex-specific case to cite, treating an error as harmless in light of an independent and sufficient alternative finding is standard fare in appellate courts. Second, and relatedly, Judge Thomas argues that our harmless error conclusion runs counter to precedent, instructing that outside of certain exceptions, courts usually cannot apply the rule of reason without an accurate definition of the relevant market. But that argument misconstrues the effect of the district court's finding on the consumer unawareness prong. If, as Judge Thomas requests, we were to just correct the district court's erroneous reasoning and then remand, the district court's market definition on remand would be foreordained. Given the total lack of evidence on consumer unawareness, Epic cannot establish its proposed aftermarkets. So contrary to the partial dissent's assertion, we do not proceed to apply the Sherman Act's liability standards without first defining relevant markets. Epic's proposed aftermarkets fail, and, App and Apple did not cross-appeal the district court's rejection of its proposed market. The district court's middle ground market of mobile game transactions thus stands on appeal, and it is that market in which we assess whether Apple's conduct is unlawful pursuant to the Sherman Act. With the relevant market for Epic's antitrust claims established, mobile game transactions, we turn to the district court's rejection of Epic's Sherman Act Section 1 Restraint of Trade claim. Section 1 prohibits every contract combination or conspiracy in restraint of trade. Courts have long read Section 1 to outlaw only unreasonable restraints. Thus, the Section 1 inquiry has both a threshold component, whether there is a contract combination or conspiracy, and a merits component, whether it is unreasonable. While the restraint can be unreasonable per se or pursuant to the rule of reason, the parties agree that the latter standard applies here. Epic contends that the district court incorrectly found that the DPLA was not a contract within the scope of Section 1, misapplied Steps 2 and 3 of the Rule of Reason, and omitted a fourth balancing step after it found that Epic failed to satisfy its Step 3 burden. Apple asserts, as an alternative basis for affirming the district court's denial of Sherman Act liability, that the court erred as Step 1 of the Rule of Reason. We agree with Epic on its first and third arguments, but find the errors to be harmless. We reject Epic's and Apple's remaining arguments. The district court erred when it held that a non-negotiated contract of adhesion like the DPLA falls outside of the scope of Section 1. To hold that a contract is exempt from antitrust scrutiny simply because one party reluctantly accepted its terms would be to read the word contract out of the statute. Moreover, the district court's contract of adhesion exemption is difficult to square with numerous antitrust cases involving agreements in which one party sets terms and the other party reluctantly acquiesced. Given the number of cases in which the district court's exemption would have been decisive, it is telling that that dog never barked. Additionally, as the district court itself recognized, its holding is not particularly consistent with ties being cognizable pursuant to Section 1. In a classic tie, the defendant exploits the control over the tying product to force the buyer into the buying of a tied product that the buyer either did not want at all or might have preferred to purchase elsewhere on different terms. In fact, this entire line of logic makes sense to me from the Ninth Circuit's direction, which is to say, a contract of adhesion is one party forcing terms on the other. That's exactly what the Sherman Antitrust Act is designed to look out for. So saying that it's a contract of adhesion and thus the Sherman Act doesn't apply doesn't work. But the court, again, is going to find this to be harmless because of the alternative analysis done by the district court throughout its 180-page decision as well. Or as the court says here, Section 1 is primarily concerned with firms that exercise market power, i.e. the special ability to force a contracting partner to do something he would not do in a competitive market. The district court's rule would preclude Section 1 suits and illegality defenses to breach of contract claims where they are most needed when dealing with restraints imposed by firms that have market power but lack the monopoly power that triggers Section 2 scrutiny. Thus, the district court erred on this threshold issue. But because the court, in the alternative, properly applied the rule of reason, its error was harmless. The district court did not err when it found that Epic made the rule of reasons required Step 1 showing. At Step 1, the plaintiff has the initial burden to prove that the challenge restraint has a substantial anti-competitive effect that harms consumers in the relevant market. To prove a substantial anti-competitive effect directly, the plaintiff must provide proof of actual detrimental effects on competition, such as reduced output, increased prices, or decreased quality in the relevant market. Importantly, showing a reduction in output is one form of direct evidence, but it is not the only measure. To prove substantial anti-competitive effects indirectly, the plaintiff must prove that the defendant has market power and present some evidence that the challenge restraint harms competition. 
Market power is the ability for a defendant to profitably raise prices by restricting output. In other words, a firm with market power is a price maker, not the price takers that economic theory expects in a competitive market. Market power is generally inferred from the defendant's position of a high market share and the existence of significant barriers to entry. Whether a defendant possesses market power is a factual question that we review only for clear error. A plaintiff must also present some evidence that the defendant uses that market power to harm competition. Market power alone does not suffice as indirect evidence for a rule of reason analysis. This inquiry need not always be extensive or highly technical. It is sufficient that the plaintiff prove the defendant's conduct as a matter of economic theory harms competition. For example, that it increases barriers of entry or reduces consumer choice by excluding would-be competitors that would offer differentiated products. Here, the district court concluded that Epic produced both sufficient direct and indirect evidence to show that Apple's distribution and IP restrictions impose substantial anti-competitive effects. In terms of direct evidence, the court found that Apple has, for years, extracted a super competitive commission that was set almost by accident and without regard to its own costs and has produced extraordinarily high operating margins that have exceeded 75% for years. The court found that the economic factors driving other platforms' rates do not apply equally to Apple with nothing other than legal action seeming to motivate Apple to reconsider pricing and reduce rates. With respect to indirect evidence, the district court found that Apple has market power. Apple had a mobile games market share of 52 to 57 percent for the three years in evidence, and network effects and information restrictions create barriers to entry. The court found that Apple wielded that market power to foreclose would-be competitors like Epic from offering app distribution and payment processing alternatives, reducing innovation in Apple's own investment in the App Store in the process. Apple challenges both the district court's direct and indirect evidence conclusions on several grounds, some legal, some factual. We are not persuaded that the district court erred at this step. First, Apple argues that the district court's direct evidence conclusion cannot stand because Epic did not show that Apple's restrictions reduced output. We squarely rejected this argument in O'Bannon. There, the NCAA similarly argued that liability was foreclosed because output in the relevant market increased steadily over time. Although output reductions are one common kind of anti-competitive effect in antitrust cases, a reduction in output is not the only measure of anti-competitive effect. Second, Apple argues that Epic's evidence of a super competitive pricing fails as a matter of law because Apple never raised its commission. A super competitive price is simply a price above competitive levels. Apple cites no binding precedent in support of his proposition that the charging of a super competitive p- price must always entail a price increase, though we recognize that it ordinarily does. Third, Apple attacks the super competitive pricing finding on factual ground by asserting that Apple charges a substantially similar commission to its competitors. That assertion is true as far as headline rates go, but the district court reasonably based its super competitive price finding on effective commission rates instead of headline rates. The district court found Apple's reliance on headline rates to be suspect because, unlike the App Store, other platforms frequently negotiate down the rates they charge developers. The court noted that Amazon has a headline rate of 30%, but an effective rate of 18% and accredited testimony that game console transaction platforms often negotiate special deals for large developers. While the district court's finding that the Google Play Store, the App Store's main competitor, charges a 30% rate seemingly undermines the characterization of Apple's commission as super competitive, we cannot say that the district court clearly erred, absent evidence about the Google Play Store's effective commission, the metric that the district court at trial found to be the key to determining the competitiveness of a price in this market. Fourth, Apple argues that the district court's direct evidence finding fails as a matter of law because Amex requires Epic to establish anti-competitive effects on both sides of a two-sided market for mobile game transactions, developers and users. Apple's argument falls short both legally and factually. We previously held, Amex does not require a plaintiff to show harm to participants on both sides of the market. All Amex held is that to establish that a practice is anti-competitive in certain two-sided markets, the plaintiff must establish an anti-competitive impact on the market as a whole. In any event, the district court found that while Apple's restrictions certainly impact developers, there was some evidence that the restrictions also impact consumers when those costs are passed on. We were also not persuaded by Apple's argument that the district court erred in concluding that Epic failed to establish indirect evidence of anti-competitive effects. Apple does not take issue with the district court's finding of a 52-55% to 55% market share, other than noting that it was the court's own calculation. Nor does Apple challenge the court's barriers to entry finding. It instead argues that the finding that Apple wields its market power in an anti-competitive manner is speculative. But supported by basic economic presumptions, the district court reasonably found that without Apple's restrictions, would-be competitors could offer iOS users alternatives that would differentiate themselves from the App Store on price as well as consumer appeal features. Indeed, it found competition in the PC gaming market to be a vivid illustration. Steam had long charged a 30% commission, but upon Epic's entry into the market, it lowered its commission to 20%. Now, that's only step one of the rule of reason. So the Ninth Circuit affirms what the district court found, which is that there are anti-competitive effects of what Apple is doing vis-a-vis its walled garden and prevention of other competing app stores. But Apple then gets the opportunity to say, but there's pro-competitive reason for this. 
The district court correctly held that Apple offered non-pretextual, legally cognizable pro-competitive rationales for its app distribution and IP restrictions. If a plaintiff establishes at step one that the defendant's restraints impose substantial anti-competitive effects, then the burden shifts back to the defendant, Apple, to show a pro-competitive rationale for the restraints. A pro-competitive rationale is a one, non-pretextual claim that the defendant's conduct is two, indeed a form of competition on the merits because it involves, for example, greater efficiency or enhanced consumer appeal. Here, the district court accepted two sets of rationales as non-pretextual and legally cognizable. First, it found that Apple implemented the restrictions to improve device security and user privacy, thereby enhancing consumer appeal and differentiating iOS devices and the App Store from those products' respective competitors. Second, the court partially accepted Apple's argument that it implemented the restrictions to be compensated for its IP investment. While the court credited the IP compensation rationale generally, it rejected the rationale with respect to the 30% commission rate specifically. On appeal, Epic raises three arguments challenging Apple's rationales as legally non-cognizable. One, Epic argues that the district court may not credit Apple's IP compensation rationale while finding that the rationale was pretextual with respect to the 30% commission rate specifically. We have held that IP compensation is a cognizable pro-competitive rationale in Kodak, and we find no error in the district court's partial crediting of that rationale here. The district court's acceptance of the rationale generally, while rejecting a specific application of it, resembles the district court's analysis in the NCAA litigation that culminated in Alston. There, the district court credited the NCAA's amateurism as consumer appeal rationale, but found that the NCAA's rules and restrictions on amateurism had shifted markedly over time. That the NCAA adopted some restrictions without any reference to considerations of consumer demand, and some were not necessary to consumer demand. The court did not, as Epic requests here, resolve the case at step two and hold that the NCAA's shaky proof meant it lacked any pro-competitive rationale. Instead, the deficiencies in the NCAA's proof of pro-competitive benefits at the second step influenced the analysis at the third step. Because the NCAA's amateurism as consumer appeal rationale was nebulously defined and weakly substantiated, the plaintiffs had more flexibility at step three to fashion less restrictive alternatives. The same is true here. Because the district court accepted only a general version of Apple's IP compensation rationale, that Apple was entitled to some compensation, which effectively Epic and other developers flatly deny, Epic at step three needed only to fashion a less restrictive alternative calibrated to achieving that general goal instead of one achieving the level of compensation that Apple currently achieves through its 30% commission. There is no legal requirement, as Epic suggests, that district courts make pretext findings on an all or nothing basis. When district courts at step two partially credit a rationale, step three will necessarily take that partial finding into account. Epic and its amici next argue that Apple's security and privacy rationales are social, not pro-competitive rationales, and therefore fall outside the purview of antitrust law. We reject this argument. To begin, Epic waived this argument by failing to raise it below. In the party's pretrial joint submission on elements and remedies, Epic agreed that enhancing consumer appeal, the goal of Apple's security and privacy efforts, is a cognizable pro-competitive justification. At trial, one of Epic's experts conceded that protecting iPhone users from security threats is a pro-competitive benefit. Epic's argument characterizes Apple as asserting security and privacy as independent justifications in and of themselves, but throughout the record, Apple makes clear that by improving security and privacy features, it is tapping into consumer demand and differentiating its products from those of its competitors, goals that are plainly pro-competitive rationales. And here is where the rubber hits the road in a certain important way, because a lot of folks that have commented on my videos or otherwise contacted me directly have suggested that iPhones and iPads and iOS ecosystem products are not more secure or not more private. And to some extent, that doesn't matter. From a logic standpoint, what Apple is selling is the notion that they could be. That if you're interested in privacy and security, this is where you go. And we're differentiating our product by having an actual human looking at what apps are operating on our system, which on a kind of intuitive level, we all understand is a little bit more protected, a little bit more controlled than just anything goes and anything goes onto that ecosystem. So. Apple is selling to the market that their stuff is more private and more secure. And if that is in fact the case and the market believes that to some great extent, then Apple has a pro-competitive justification for differentiating its products in this way, even if you personally don't believe it. Consumer surveys in the record show that security and privacy is an important aspect of a device purchase for 50 to 62% of iPhone users and 76 to 89% of iPad users worldwide. Even Epic CEO testified that he purchased an iPhone over an Android smartphone in part because it offers better security and privacy. With Apple's restrictions in place, users are free to decide which kind of app transaction platform to use. Users who value security and privacy can select, by purchasing an iPhone, Apple's closed platform and pay a marginally higher price for apps. 
Users who place a premium on low prices can, by purchasing an Android device, select one of the several open app transaction platforms which provide marginally less security and privacy. Apple's restrictions create a heterogeneous market for app transaction platforms, which as a result increases interbrand competition, the primary goal of antitrust law. And this paragraph I really think is the one that should be put on the bulletin board for folks that are interested in Epic versus Apple. This is the best understanding, best description that I have seen from these courts or any of the other documents that we've looked at in this entire playlist for what I mean when a walled garden is still pro-competitive, right? People look at that and say, well, the walled garden itself is anti-competitive. That's kind of the step one analysis. But when we're talking about giving consumers more choices, what the Apple walled garden approach does is allows consumers to choose for themselves what product they want to enter into, what ecosystem they want to enter into. Yes, developers don't like that. Tim Sweeney doesn't like that. Epic Games doesn't like that. That makes a ton of sense. But from Apple's perspective, they get to control what product they put out in the market. And the court, I think, rightly finds here that Apple having a differentiated market, even if that differentiation involves building a wall, is useful to providing consumers with more choices in the overall marketplace. So that's what the court determines here, and I think that's largely right. Antitrust law assumes that competition best allocates resources by allowing firms to compete on all elements of a bargain, quality, service, safety, and durability, and not just the immediate cost. If we were to accept Epic and its amici's friends' argument that no defendant could cite competing on non-price features as a pro-competitive rationale. To avoid this conclusion, Epic and its amici rely on a line of cases stemming from National Society of Professional Engineers. But neither that case nor its progeny support their argument that improved quality is a social rather than pro-competitive rationale. Instead, the Professional Engineers line of cases holds that a defendant cannot severely limit inter-brand competition on the theory that competition itself is ill-suited to a certain market or industry. Epic's selection of quotes from professional engineers in other cases, without acknowledging the distinct context in which they occurred, is unconvincing, which is the court saying, you're lying. In Professional Engineers, a professional association with about 12,000 engineers adopted a rule prohibiting its members from engaging in competitive bidding on construction projects. This absolute ban on competitive bidding imposed substantial and competitive effects, and the society's sole justification was that competition in the construction engineering market would lead engineers to perform inferior work with consequent risk to safety and health. In other words, competition in the construction engineering industry was not in the public benefit. The Supreme Court rejected this request for a judge-made exemption to the rule of reason, which does not support a defense based on the assumption that competition itself is unreasonable, and stated that the society's argument should be addressed to Congress. Yeah, the antitrust laws in the United States are pretty blanket. They don't otherwise talk about where competition might be a bad idea. And if you've got policy considerations for that, the court system is the wrong place to advance them. Indiana Federation of Dentists likewise involves a request for an exemption from the rule of reason. They are an association of dentists which had nearly 100% market share in one area and 70% market share in another, adopted a rule prohibiting its members from submitting x-rays to dental insurers. The Federation argued that competition would undermine quality of care, that without the rule consumers would make unwise and even dangerous choices regarding dental procedures. The Supreme Court rejected this argument that competition was ill-suited for the dental industry as squarely foreclosed by professional engineers. Trial Lawyers Association followed a similar track but with respect to a requested exemption from a per se rule. A professional association comprised about 90% of regulars appointed for indigent criminal defense in the Superior Court of the District of Columbia entered into a group boycott against the district until it substantially increased hourly rates. The association argued that its actions were not unlawful because the district had a constitutional duty to provide adequate representation to indigent defendants, which required it to provide meaningful compensation to their attorneys. The court refused to exempt the association's conduct from the normal application of antitrust's per se prohibition on group boycotts, concluding that the social justifications proffered for respondents' restraint of trade do not make it any less unlawful. The Supreme Court followed suit last term in Alston when it rejected the NCAA's sweeping plea for leniency. The NCAA argued that something more differential than the rule of reason should apply to its restrictions on student-athlete compensation because the NCAA's amateurism restrictions advance the societally important non-commercial objective of higher education. The Supreme Court held that this argument, that the NCAA should be exempt from the usual operation of the antitrust laws, should be directed to Congress, not a court. Apple's rationales categorically differ from those asserted in the above cases. Apple did not agree with other app transaction platforms, e.g. the Google Play Store, to eliminate inter-brand competition and then invoke security and privacy to avoid the normal operation of the rule of reason. Rather, Apple imposed intra-band limitations that iOS devices use Apple distribution and payment processing channels and contends that these restrictions tap into consumer demand for a private and secure user experience and distinguish the App Store from its open platform competitors. Epic finally argues that even if Apple's security and privacy restrictions are pro-competitive, they increase competition in a different market than the district court defined in which Epic showed step one anti-competitive effects, 
unless they're not legally cognizable at step two. In Epic's view, Apple's rationales relate to the market for smartphone operating systems, or the market for smartphones, while the anti-competitive effects of Apple's restrictions impact the market for mobile game transactions. The Supreme Court's precedent on this issue is not clear. While Mickey argued in Alston that cross-market justifications fail as a matter of law, the Supreme Court expressed no view on that argument. Dicta from one per se decision provides some support for Epic's position, but the Supreme Court has considered cross-market rationales in rule of reason and monopolization cases. See Kodak, relevant market of Kodak brand service and parts, pro-competitive rationale in a market for photocopiers. While we have never expressly confronted this issue, we have previously considered cross-market rationales when applying the rule of reason. We decline to decide the issue here. Like Epic's general cognizability argument, Epic did not raise this argument below, nor did it raise this argument in its opening brief before our court, denying Apple an opportunity to respond. More importantly, we need not decide this issue because Epic's arguments rest on an incorrect reading of the record. Contrary to Epic's contention, Apple's pro-competitive justifications do relate to the app transactions market. Because use of the App Store requires an iOS device, there are two ways of increasing App Store output. One, increasing the total number of iOS device users, and two, increasing the average number of downloads and in-app purchases made by an iOS device user. Below, the district court found that a large portion of consumers factored security and privacy into their decision to purchase an iOS device, increasing total iOS device users. It also found that Apple security and privacy-related restrictions provide a safe and trusted user experience on iOS, which encourages both users and developers to transact freely, increasing the per-user average number of app transactions. So here, on this particular argument, the court is really not happy with Epic. They say that you didn't bring it up below, and also you're wrong on what the district court found. The district court did not clearly err when it held that Epic failed to prove the existence of substantially less restrictive alternatives to achieve Apple's pro-competitive rationale. So here we are in step three. At step three of the rule of reason, the burden shifts back to the plaintiff to demonstrate that the pro-competitive efficiencies could be reasonably achieved through less anti-competitive means. When evaluating proposed alternative means, courts must give wide berth to defendants' business judgments and must resist the temptation to require that enterprises employ the least restrictive means of achieving their legitimate business objectives. In other words, antitrust law does not require businesses to use anything like the least restrictive means of achieving legitimate business purposes. As such, this circuit's test, which, is, which the Supreme Court approved in Alston, requires a substantially less restrictive alternative. To qualify as substantially less restrictive, an alternative must be virtually as effective in serving the defendant's pro-competitive purposes without significantly increased costs. Because LRAs inform the injunctive relief that a district court may enter if a plaintiff prevails, courts must also keep in mind a healthy respect for the practical limits of judicial administration when evaluating proposed LRAs. Courts should not impose a duty that it cannot explain or adequately and reasonably supervise. Epic argues that Apple already has an LRA at its disposal for the distribution restriction, the notarization model that Apple uses for app distribution on its desktop and laptop operating system, Mac. The notarization model sits somewhere between iOS's walled garden and the open platform model that characterizes some app transaction platforms. Unlike on iOS, the Mac Store, the Apple-run equivalent of the iOS App Store for Mac computers, is not the exclusive means for Mac OS users to download apps. Instead, users can download apps from the Mac Store or anywhere else on the internet. Also, unlike an iOS, a developer can distribute a macOS app to users without first submitting it to Apple. But regardless of how the developer distributes that app, it will carry a warning that Apple has not scanned it for malware. The developer, however, can choose to submit the app to Apple. If the app passes Apple's malware scan, then the developer can distribute the app to users, again through the Mac Store or otherwise, without the warning that accompanies unscanned apps. The malware scanning that Apple performs in the notarization model is not the same as the full app review that it conducts on iOS apps. Importantly, the notarization model does not include human review, a contextual review that, as found by the district court, cannot currently be automated. As part of iOS human review, a reviewer confirmed that an app corresponds to its marketing description to weed out Trojan horse apps or social engineering attacks that trick users into downloading by posing as something that they are not. The reviewer also checks the app's entitlements are reasonable for its purpose, rejecting, for example, a tic-tac-toe game that asks for camera access and health data, while approving camera access for a social media app. On occasion, Human Review also detects novel, well-disguised malware attacks. Despite Epic carrying the burden in Step 3 of the Royal Reason, it was not clear before the District Court, and still is not entirely clear, how Epic proposes that the notarization model translates from macOS to iOS. In particular, it is unclear whether the proposed model would incorporate Human Review and what type, if any, of licensing scheme Apple could implement to complement the notarization model. Whatever the precise form of Epic's proposed notarization model, the District Court did not err in rejecting it. First, to the extent Epic argues that Apple could jot for jot adopt macOS's notarization model without adding human review, Epic failed to establish that this model would be virtually as effective in accomplishing Apple's pro-competitive rationales of enhancing consumer appeal and distinguishing the App Store from competitor app transaction platforms 
by improving user security and privacy. The district court ultimately found that the record contained some evidence that macOS computers experience higher malware rates than iOS devices. It also noted that a third-party report that Android devices have higher malware rates than iOS due to Trojan horse apps being distributed through open app transaction platforms. Based on this record, the district court did not clearly err in finding that a process without human app review would not be virtually as effective as Apple's current model. Second, to the extent Epic proposes a notarization model that incorporates human app review, Epic failed to develop how Apple could be compensated in such a model for third-party developers' use of its IP. Epic argues that app review can be relatively independent on app distribution and envisions a model in which a developer would submit an app, Apple would review it, and then send it back to the developer to be distributed directly or in another store. For example, Epic could submit a gaming app to Apple, Apple would scan it for malware and subject it to human review, and then Epic could choose to distribute it through the App Store, the Epic Game Store, or both. While such a model would clearly be virtually as effective in achieving Apple's security and privacy rationales, as it contains all elements of Apple's current model, Epic simply failed to develop how such a model would allow Apple to be compensated for developers' use of its IP. And this is because Epic doesn't care. At closing arguments, the district court asked Epic whether its requested injunctive relief would allow Apple to impose some sort of licensing fee. Epic responded that Apple can charge, but it offered no concrete guidance on how to do so. The district court accordingly found that Epic's proposed distribution LRAs leave unclear whether Apple can collect licensing royalties, and if so, how it would do so, and thus declined to consider them as not sufficiently developed. On appeal, Epic attempts to transfigure it into an LRA in the district court's offhand statement, noting the absence of evidence that Apple could not create a tiered licensing scheme which would better correlate the value of its intellectual property to the various levels of use by developers. It is, however, Epic's burden at step three to prove that a tiered licensing scheme or some other payment mechanism could achieve Apple's IP compensation rationale. Without any evidence in the record of what this tiered licensing scheme could look like, we cannot say it would be virtually as effective without significantly increased cost. Nor can we even explain it, let alone direct the district court to craft an injunction that it could adequately and reasonably supervise. Epic proposes access to competing payment processors as an LRA to Apple's IAP requirement. Like the distribution requirement LRA, this LRA suffers from a failure of proof on how it would achieve Apple's IP compensation rationale. As the district court noted, in a world where Apple maintains its distribution restriction but payment processing is opened up, Apple would still be contractually entitled to its 30% commission on in-app purchasers. Apart from any argument by Epic, the district court presumed that Apple could utilize a contractual right to audit developers to ensure compliance with its commissions, but the court then rejected such audits as an LRA because they would seemingly impose both increased monetary and time costs. So, backing up a step, you can see one of the reasons I highlighted that the IP compensation rationale was so important is that Epic basically doesn't believe that Apple is entitled to IP compensation and so really didn't properly brief or argue this point to the satisfaction of either the district court or here the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And that is causing them to lose most of the arguments here on whether they can find something that is a reasonable alternative, a less restrictive alternative to what Apple currently does. Because the courts are concerned that Apple does have a right to control its intellectual property, does have a right to get compensated for that. That's generally seen as pro-competitive because we want industry participants to be able to make money from their investment and their research and their development of goods and services in markets. And Epic mostly doesn't care about that argument. So until they win that philosophical argument at some kind of court or congressional level here in the United States, this is what they're going to continue to run up against if they just want to zero out a platform from getting any money for their intellectual property. Step four, balancing. Epic, along with several amici, including the United States and 34 state attorneys general, yeah, the court will pay attention to that generally, argue that the district court erred by not proceeding to a fourth totality of the circumstances step in the rule of reason and balancing the anti-competitive effects of Apple's conduct against its pro-competitive benefits. We hold that our precedent requires a court to proceed to this fourth step where, like here, the plaintiff fails to carry its step three burden of establishing viable less restrictive alternatives. However, the district court's failure to expressly do this was harmless in this case. In fact, the Ninth Circuit is going to say that, yes, this appears to be the precedent, but we really don't understand why it would ever be important as part of their argument here. I don't think that's the strongest legal argumentation, but I think they raise a good point as to the fact that you're doing a balancing test already and you wind up in step four after step three suggests that you are in a place where the rule of reason has otherwise been satisfied, that there is not an antitrust problem in the particular instance. We have been inconsistent in how we describe the rule of reason. Some decisions when describing the rule of reason contemplate a fourth step. Because of the paucity of cases that survive step one, let alone require a court to exhaust the three agreed upon steps, most of our decisions have not required us to actually proceed to the portion of the analysis where Epic and the Amici argue balancing would occur. The exception is counting to Alumna, which provides the most on-point guidance regarding the existence of a fourth step. There we held, because plaintiffs have failed to meet their burden of advancing viable, less restrictive alternatives, we reached the balancing stage. We must balance the harms and benefits of the challenged restrictions to determine whether they are reasonable. We then concluded with just one sentence of analysis 
that any anti-competitive harm is offset by the pro-competitive effects of the defendant's efforts to maintain the quality of patient care that it provides. Supreme Court precedent neither requires a fourth step nor disavows it. We are skeptical of the wisdom of superimposing a totality of the circumstances balancing step onto a three-part test that is already intended to assess the restraint's overall effect. Neither Epic nor any amicus has articulated what this balancing really entails in a given case. Epic argues only that the district court must weigh anti-competitive harms against pro-competitive benefits, and the United States describes step four as a qualitative assessment of whether the harms or benefits predominate. Nor is it evident what value a balancing step adds. Several amici suggest that balancing is needed to pick out restrictions that have significant anti-competitive effects but only minimal pro-competitive benefits, but the three-step framework is already designed to identify such an imbalance. The court is likely to find the purported benefits pretextual at step two, or step three review will likely reveal the existence of viable LRAs. We are thus wary about this invitation to set sail on a sea of doubt. Now here I think the Ninth Circuit is being a little bit overly broad. I think it does make sense to say, if you've got anti-competitive effects and pro-competitive justifications, but there aren't less restrictive alternatives, that the court can otherwise analyze whether the pro-competitive benefits outweigh the anti-competitive effects. That said, the Ninth Circuit is going to allow the invitation, but not otherwise take it up very much. Nonetheless, we are bound by County of Tulumne, and mindful of Alston's warning that the first three steps of the rule of reason are not a rote checklist. Therefore, where a plaintiff's case comes up short at step three, the district court must proceed to step four and balance the restrictions and anti-competitive harms against its pro-competitive benefits. In most instances, this will require nothing more than, as in County of Tulumne, briefly confirming the results suggested by a step three failure, that a business practice without a less restrictive alternative is not on balance and anti-competitive. But the Sherman Act is a flexible statute that has and will continue to evolve to meet our country's changing economy, so we will not embarrass the future by suggesting that will always be the case. Turning to the record here, the district court's failure to explicitly reach the fourth step was harmless. Even though it did not expressly reference a step four, it stated that it carefully considered the evidence in the record and determined that based on the rule of reason, the distribution and IAP restrictions have pro-competitive effects that offset their anti-competitive effects, emphasis added. This analysis satisfied the court's obligation, and the court's failure to expressly give this analysis a step four label was harmless. Now, I think the Ninth Circuit is being pretty generous to the district court here. If a four step is required, I don't really think that sentence does the job. But overall, I understand what they're trying to say, which is that by the time you get to three steps of balancing, you should have an understanding of whether or not the restriction is something that we're going to view as anti-competitive overall. Now on to tying. In addition to its general restraint of trade claim, Epic brought a Section 1 claim asserting that Apple unlawfully tied together App Distribution, the App Store, and In-App Payment Processing, IAP. On appeal, Epic argues that 1. The district court clearly erred when it found that Epic did not identify separate products, and 2. We can enter judgment in its favor because the tie is unlawful, either per se or pursuant to the rule of reason. We agree with Epic that the district court clearly erred in separate products finding, but we find that error to be harmless. The rule of reason applies to the tie involved here, and for the reasons explained, Epic failed to establish that Apple's design of the iOS ecosystem, which ties the App Store and IAP together, is anti-competitive. A. The existence of a tie. A tying arrangement is an agreement by a party to sell one product, but only on the condition that the buyer also purchases a different or tied product, or at least agrees that he will not purchase that product from any other supplier. To prove the existence of a tie, a party must make two showings. First, the agreement must of course involve two or more separate products. To constitute two separate products, there must be sufficient consumer demand so that it is efficient for a firm to provide the product separately. Importantly, the separate products inquiry turns not on the functional relationship between them, but rather on the character of the demand for the two items. This consumer demand test, in turn, has two parts. One, that it is possible to separate the products, and two, that it is efficient to do so, as inferred from circumstantial evidence. The efficiency showing does not require a full-blown economic analysis. Accordingly, the existence of separate products is inferred from more readily observed facts. These include consumer requests to offer the product separately, disentangling of the products by competitors, analogous practices in related markets, and the defendant's historical practice. Second, even where a transaction involves separate products, it is not necessarily a tie. The seller must also force the buyer into the purchase of a tied product that the buyer either did not want at all or might have preferred to purchase elsewhere on different terms. Here, the district court found that there was no tie because app distribution and IAP are not separate products. It based this finding on four rationales, each of which is either clearly erroneous or incorrect as a matter of law. To begin, the district court erred as a matter of law when it concluded that IAP was not separate from app distribution because IAP is integrated into iOS devices. Jefferson Parish expressly rejects an approach to the separate products inquiry based on the functional relation between two purported products. Next, the district court clearly erred when it found that Epic Games presented no evidence showing that demand exists for IAP as a standalone product. Here, the App Store and IAP clearly can be separated because Apple already does so in certain contexts, namely that IAP is not required for in-app purchases of physical goods. The efficiency showing is also met. Epic produced evidence that it, Facebook, Microsoft, Spotify, Match, and Netflix 
have all tried to convince Apple to let them develop their own in-app payment solutions. The Epic Games Store, a direct competitor of Apple in the mobile game submarket, delinks distribution from payment processing. And prior to IAP's development in 2009, Apple distributed apps through the App Store but permitted developers to use their own in-app payment systems, which I think is probably the most salient of evidence. Relatedly, the district court clearly erred when it reasoned that even if Apple did not require IAP, Apple would still be entitled to collect a commission on payments made, and therefore no economically rational developer would choose to use the alternative payment processor. The district court itself found that Epic Games raises legitimate concerns about the non-priced features of IAP, including that Apple does a poor job of mediating disputes between a developer and its customers, that Apple one-size-fits-all refund approach leads to poor customer experiences, and that IAP's exclusion of developers from transactions can also increase fraud. Finally, the district court erred as a matter of law when it concluded that a product in a two-sided market can never be broken into multiple products. Despite Apple's strained effort to portray this as a factual finding, the district court imposed a bright-line legal rule. But Amex simply does not stand for the proposition that any two-sided platform will necessarily relate only to one market. Instead, it emphasized that market definition must reflect commercial realities. A tie can be unlawful pursuant to either a modified per se rule or the rule of reason. A tie is per se unlawful if the defendant has market power in the tying product market and the tying arrangement affects a non-insubstantial volume of commerce in the tied product market. The first prong requires the market power inquiry standard throughout antitrust law. The second prong requires only that the tie affect an amount of commerce in the tied product market that is not de minimis. These requirements are met here. Apple has market power in the app distribution market and the tie affects a non-de minimis amount of commerce in the app payment processing market. Apple requires IAP to be used for more than half of the transactions that comprise a $100 billion market. Nonetheless, we join the DC circuit in holding that per se condemnation is inappropriate for ties involving software that serves as a platform for third party applications. It is only after considerable experience with certain business relationships that courts classify them as per se violations. That is because per se condemnation embodies a judicial assessment that a category of restraints is plainly anti-competitive and lacking in any redeeming virtue such that it can be conclusively presumed illegal. Given the cost of improperly condemning a practice across the board, extending a per se rule requires caution and judicial humility. We need to know more than we do about the actual impact of these arrangements on competition to decide whether they should be classified as per se violations of the Sherman Act. As you can probably tell from watching this, a per se violation is really, you've lost. If we find that you are engaged in a per se kind of anti-competitive act, then you are going to lose your antitrust argument. And so the court is very careful about putting things into that per se bucket, such as IAP being tied with app distribution. Based on the record, we do not have the level of confidence needed to universally condemn ties related to app transaction platforms that combine multiple functionalities. Because of the pervasively innovative character of platform software markets, tying in such markets may produce efficiencies that courts have not previously encountered and thus the Supreme Court had not factored into the per se rule as originally conceived. The tie in this case differs markedly from those the Supreme Court considered in Jefferson Parish and prior tying cases. Particularly, in none of these cases was the tied good technologically integrated with the tying good. Moreover, none of the ties presented any purported pro-competitive benefits that could not be achieved by adopting quality standards for third-party suppliers of the tied good, as Apple does here. Moreover, while Jefferson Parish's separate products test filters out pro-competitive bundles from per se scrutiny in traditional markets, we are skeptical that it does so in the market involved here. Software markets are highly innovative and feature short product lifetimes, with a constant process of bundling, unbundling, and rebundling of various functions. In such a market, any first mover product risks being labeled a tie pursuant to the separate products test. If per se condemnation were to follow, we could remove would-be popular products from the market, dampening innovation and undermining the very competitive process that antitrust law is meant to protect. The rule of reason guards against that risk by affording the first mover an opportunity to demonstrate that an efficiency gain from its tie adequately offsets any distortion of consumer choice. Applying the rule of reason to the tie involved here, it is clearly lawful. Epic's tying claim is simply a repackaging of its generic Section 1 claim. For the reasons we explained above, Epic failed to carry its burden of proving that Apple's structure of the iOS ecosystem, on the whole, is unreasonable. We now consider Epic's Sherman Act Section 2 claim that Apple unlawfully maintained a monopoly. A Section 2 monopolization claim has two elements. One, the possession of monopoly power in the relevant market, and two, the willful acquisition or maintenance of that power as distinguished from growth or development as a consequence of a superior product business acumen, or historic accident. At step one, the plaintiff must establish that the defendant possesses monopoly power, which is the substantial ability to control prices or exclude competition. Monopoly power differs in degree from market power, requiring something greater. Like market power, monopoly power can be established either directly or indirectly. At step two, the plaintiff must show that the defendant acquired or maintained its monopoly through anti-competitive conduct. This anti-competitive conduct requirement is essentially the same as the rule of reason inquiry applicable to section one claims. 
At step one in this case, the district court found that although Apple possesses considerable market power in the market for mobile gaming transactions, that power is not durable enough to constitute monopoly power given the influx nature of the market. It then, at step two, echoed its rule of reason conclusion that Epic failed to establish Apple's restrictions were anti-competitive. We affirm the district court's rejection of section two liability. Epic does not argue on appeal that the district court clearly erred in finding that Apple lacks monopoly power in the mobile games market. It argues only that the district court erred in rejecting its single brand markets in which Apple would have 100% of the market share, an argument we reject above, which remember was based on Epic failing to prove that consumers didn't know about distribution and IAP restrictions. Breach of contract. Apple countersued Epic for breach of contract. Epic stipulated that it breached the DPLA when it implemented the Fortnite hotfix, which allowed it to process in-game transactions in violation of Apple's IAP restriction. Epic raised several affirmative defenses, however, and argued that the DPLA is illegal, void as against public policy, and unconscionable. The district court rejected each defense, and Epic now challenges the illegality holding on appeal. The parties agree that Epic's illegality defense rises and falls with its Sherman Act claims. Because we affirm the district court's holding that Epic failed to prove Apple's liability pursuant to the Sherman Act, we also affirm its rejection of Epic's illegality defenses. We now turn to Apple's cross-appeal, beginning with its arguments concerning the UCL. That's the California Unfair Competition Law, remember. The district court found that Epic suffered an injury sufficient to confer Article III standing, concluded that Apple's anti-steering provision violates the UCL's unfair prong, and entered an injunction prohibiting Apple from enforcing the anti-steering provision against any developer. Apple challenges each aspect on appeal, but we affirm. We agree with the district court. Standing. Article 3 limits federal court's jurisdiction to cases and controversies. One essential aspect of this limitation is that any person invoking the power of a federal court must demonstrate standing to do so. Constitutional standing requires a showing of a concrete and particularized injury that is fairly traceable to the challenged conduct and is likely to be redressed by a favorable decision. Apple terminated Epic's iOS developer account in August of 2020. Then, in September 2021, after the district court issued its order holding that Epic breached the DPLA, Apple informed Epic that it had no intention of reinstating Epic's developer account. As a result, Epic has no apps remaining on the App Store. Apple therefore argues that Epic is no longer injured by the anti-steering provision. Apple's argument, however, overlooks two critical aspects of the record. First, while Epic itself has no apps on the App Store, its subsidiaries do, causing Epic to be injured through the anti-steering provision's effects on its subsidiaries' earnings. Second. Epic is a competing game distributor through the Epic Game Store and offers a 12% commission compared to Apple's 30% commission. If consumers can learn about lower app prices, which are made possible by developers' lower costs, and have the ability to substitute to the platform with those lower prices, they will do so, increasing the revenue that the Epic Game Store generates. Now, that's a nice story, but I do think that it's interesting to note the Epic Game Store's 12% commission has not, at least in my view, tangibly reduced the price of the product to consumers, even though developers are getting an 18% increase in their cut of the profitability of a sale of a game. This is actually hypothetical that that commission reduction is getting passed on to consumers in a way that can function to improve Epic Game Store's livelihood. That said, I find the argument that they have subsidiaries still on the platform more compelling in any event. Merits. As relevant here, the UCL prohibits any unlawful, unfair, or fraudulent business act or practice. As the UCL's three-prong structure makes clear, a business practice may be unfair and therefore illegal under the UCL, even if not specifically prescribed by some other law. The unfair prong is intentionally framed in its broad, sweeping language precisely to enable judicial tribunals to deal with the innumerable new schemes which the fertility of man's invention would contrive. California has very broad laws on this type of thing, and the UCL is one of those. The California Supreme Court has refined this wide standard into two tests relevant to this litigation. First, to support any finding of unfairness to competitors, a court uses the tethering test, which asks whether the defendant's conduct threatens an incipient violation of antitrust law or violates the policy or spirit of one of those laws because its effects are comparable to or the same as a violation of the law or otherwise significantly threatens or harms competition. Second, to support a finding of unfairness to consumers, a court uses the balancing test, which weighs the utility of the defendant's conduct against the gravity of the harm to the alleged victim. Here, the district court applied both tests. Through the Epic Game Store, Epic is a games distribution competitor of Apple, triggering the competitor test. Through its subsidiaries that have apps on the App Store, Epic consumes the app transactions that Apple offers in a two-sided market, triggering the consumer test. Applying the tethering test, the court found that the anti-steering provisions decrease consumer information, enabling super competitive profits, and resulting in decreased innovation. It relied on Apple's own internal communications for the proposition that the anti-steering provision prevents developers from using two of the three most effective marketing activities, push notifications and email outreach. Apple does not directly challenge the district court's application of the UCL's tethering and balancing test to the facts of the case. Instead, Apple makes two arguments attacking UCL liability as a matter of law. Neither is supported by California law. Apple argues that Epic's failure to establish Sherman Act liability forecloses UCL liability pursuant to the UCL's safe harbor doctrine, 
which bars a UCL action where California or federal statutory law absolutely precludes private causes of action or clearly permits the defendant's conduct. The Safe Harbor Doctrine emphasizes that there is a difference between not making an activity unlawful and making that activity lawful. Accordingly, in every instance where a court found the Sherman Act to preclude a UCL action, a categorical antitrust rule formed the basis of the decision. We held that the judge-made baseball exemption, that the business of providing public baseball games for profit is not within the scope of the federal antitrust laws, precluded a UCL action. The California Court of Appeals similarly held that the Colgate Doctrine, that it is lawful for a company to unilaterally announce the terms on which it will deal, precluded a UCL action. Neither Apple nor any of its amici cite a single case in which a court has held that when a federal antitrust claim suffers from a proof deficiency rather than a categorical legal bar, the conduct underlying the antitrust claim cannot be deemed unfair pursuant to the UCL. Indeed, in a leading case on the safe harbor exemption, the California Supreme Court permitted a UCL claim against a predatory price scheme to proceed, even though the plaintiff failed to prove, as state antitrust law required, that the defendant intended to harm competition through the scheme. So the difference there is categorical, as the court suggests. If there is a broad rule that says this kind of activity is permitted, baseball, Colgate, unilateral announcement of terms, which I do think is pretty close to what Apple's arguing, but not entirely the same, then yes, that'll prohibit you from bringing a UCL action because it's otherwise allowed. Instead, as here, where you've got a case that could have been won by Epic if they had the right proof, that doesn't get you out of a UCL action because the antitrust failing is not categorical, it's just one of evidence. Apple next argues that two principles from Sherman Act case law preclude UCL liability here. We find neither argument persuasive. First, Apple contends that the Supreme Court's decision in Amex, finding in favor of American Express in a suit challenging its anti-steering provision, bars UCL liability stemming from Apple's anti-steering provision. Apple does not explain how Amex's fact and market specific application of the first prong of the rule of reason establishes a categorical rule approving anti-steering provisions, much less one that sweeps beyond the Sherman Act to reach the UCL. Amex was based on the plaintiff's failure to establish direct evidence of anti-competitive effects. It was not a blanket approval of anti-steering provisions. Second, Apple argues that the UCL mandates trial courts to define a relevant market and then conduct the balancing test within that market, similar to the rule of reason. Again, Apple does not cite any California authority for this proposition. Moreover, such a rule runs contrary to the California court's repeated instruction that no inflexible rule can be laid down as to what conduct will constitute unfair competition. So again, California is just very broad here. It also contradicts a California Supreme Court decision that conducted something akin to quick look review in which a precise market definition is not needed when confronted with significant restrictions on the free flow of price information. Injunctive relief. Apple also argues that the district court clearly erred when it found that Epic's injuries were irreparable and it abuses its discretion when applying the injunction against all developers, not just Epic subsidiaries that have apps on the App Store. We disagree. To issue an injunction, the court must find that the plaintiff has suffered irreparable injury, the remedies available at laws such as monetary damages are inadequate to compensate for that injury, that considering the balance of hardships between the plaintiff and defendant, a remedy is equity is warranted, and that the public interest would not be disturbed by a permanent injunction. We review a district court's decision to grant a permanent injunction and the scope of the injunction for an abuse of discretion and review the factual findings underlying the injunction for clear error. First, the district court did not clearly err in finding that Epic suffered an injury for which monetary damages would be inadequate. While economic injury is generally not considered irreparable, it is where the underlying injury does not readily lend itself to calculable money damages. Here, the district court found that the anti-steering provision is not easily remedied with money damages, a finding that has ample support in the record. In 2019, there were over 300,000 games on the App Store. Calculating the damages caused by the anti-steering provision would require a protracted and speculative inquiry into the availability of each of those 300,000 games on the Epic Game Store, the percentage of revenue on each game that comes from users who multi-home and can therefore substitute, and how high the substitution rate would be among those multi-home users. Second, the district court did not abuse its discretion when setting the scope of the injunctive relief because the scope is tied to Epic's injuries. The district court found that the anti-steering provision harmed Epic by increasing the cost of Epic subsidiaries' apps that are still on the App Store and preventing other apps' users from becoming would-be Epic Game Store consumers. Because Epic benefits in the second way from consumers of other developers' apps being purchased through the Epic Game Store, an injunction limited to Epic subsidiaries would fail to address the full harm caused by the anti-steering provision. Finally, attorney's fees. We reverse the district court's holding that the DPLA's indemnification provision does not require Epic to pay Apple's attorney's fees related to this litigation. Based on the DPLA's choice of law provision, we interpret its indemnification provision pursuant to California contract interpretation principles. We reviewed the district court's interpretation of a contract de novo from the start on our own. California courts presume that a clause that contains the words indemnify and hold harmless generally obligates the indemnitor to reimburse the indemnity for any damages the indemnity becomes obligated to pay third persons. That is, it relates to third-party claims 
not attorney fees incurred in a breach of contract action between the parties to the indemnity agreement itself. However, courts also look to the context in which the language appears. A contract, therefore, can rebut this presumption with language that specifically provides for attorney fees in an action on the contract. For example, the California Court of Appeal read an indemnification clause to cover intra-party disputes when the clause covered all losses, whether or not arising out of third-party claims. And it did the same where an indemnification clause was accompanied by a clause clarifying that, in addition to the remedies listed by the indemnification clause, each party could also seek specific performance for certain breaches of the contract, a provision that would be unnecessary if indemnification only referred to third-party claims. And we can go review this section in the DPLA ourselves. Under indemnification, it says, you agree to indemnify Apple and its directors and employees and everyone else from any and all claims, losses, liabilities, damages, taxes, expenses, and costs, including without limitation attorney's fees and court costs, arising from or related to, among other things, your breach of any certification, covenant, obligation, representation, or warranty in this agreement. Which is a funny way of saying that you couldn't possibly get indemnification for another party's breach of the agreement that you just entered into with them, because it seems to say exactly the opposite, which is what the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals will find. One grounds clause one applies to Epic's breach of any certification, covenant, obligation, representation, or warranty in the DPLA. Clause one rebuts the Alki Partners presumption by specifically providing attorney's fees in an action on the contract. It expressly refers to Epic's breach of its obligations pursuant to the agreement itself, contemplating an intra-party action for breach of contract, not claims by third parties. The surrounding context of section 10 buttresses this conclusion. Therefore, we hold that clause one contemplates intra-party disputes and Apple is entitled to attorney fees pursuant to it. To echo our observation from the NCAA student-athlete litigation, there is a lively and important debate about the role played in our economy and democracy by online transaction platforms with market power. Our job as a federal court of appeals, however, is not to resolve that debate, nor would we even attempt to do so. Instead, in this decision, we faithfully applied existing precedent to the facts as the parties developed them below. For the foregoing reasons, we affirm in part and reverse and remand in part. So as I mentioned at the top of this video, the basics here are that the district court's holding remains. and. The only exception to that is that Apple looks to be entitled to the attorney's fees that it otherwise has incurred in this specific litigation due to Epic's breach of the DPLA. But you can see because of all the references in the Ninth Circuit Court's determination why I had a specific video in this playlist, why did Apple just submit a college football case, Alston, to the court? That that was so determinative of how the Ninth Circuit saw this particular understanding of antitrust law and was going to look at it essentially on Apple's behalf throughout. Now, S.R. Thomas, circuit judge, concurs in part, I agree with much of the majority opinion, but dissents in important parts as well. I fully agree that the district court properly granted Epic injunctive relief on its California unfair competition law claims. I also fully agree that the district court properly rejected Epic's illegality defenses to the developer program licensing agreement, but that contrary to the district court's decision, the DPLA does require Epic to pay attorney's fees for its breach. On the federal claims, I also agree that the district court erred in defining the relevant market and erred when it held that a non-negotiated contract of adhesion falls outside of the scope of Section 1 of the Sherman Act. However, unlike the majority, I would not conclude that those errors were harmless. The district court's errors relate to threshold analytical steps, and the errors affected Epic's substantial rights. I agree with the majority that the district court erred in rejecting Epic's pro-offered form market. The district court rejected the form market of mobile operating systems because Apple does not sell or license its operating systems separately from its smartphones, but we have previously recognized that such a market can exist. The district court then rejected Epic's proposed aftermarket of solutions for iOS app payment processing because IAP is integrated in the operation system. This conclusion was not only legally erroneous, but in contradiction to the district court's factual finding of separate demand. I also agree with the majority that the district court erred in holding that the non-negotiated contract of adhesion falls outside of the scope of Section 1 of the Sherman Act, and therefore the developer program license agreement was not a contract covered under Section 1. The majority holds that these errors were harmless given the district court's analysis of the remaining steps in the rule of reason. However, there is no direct authority for this proposition, and it amounts to appellate court fact-finding. Correction of these errors would have changed the substance of the district court's rule of reason analysis. And that's where these two parties really disagree. The majority has said, as we discussed when we were going over the majority's opinion, that because the court didn't find proper evidence for the aftermarkets in general, Epic's aftermarkets were never going to be the market. Apple didn't fight for its market. And so the district court made what it thought was the appropriate fact finding of the appropriate market, mobile game transactions. And there's no reason to change that just based on the fact that the fore market exists. The evidence for the aftermarket still doesn't exist. This particular dissent says, well, if we get the fore market right, well, maybe the things change in the rule of reason analysis for the aftermarket. And we can't know that without the actual district court doing that fact finding. And so by saying that it won't change, we're making some kind of fact finding determination on our own.
I agree with the majority more than the dissent on this, but I do think it's important to always understand what the various parties are thinking when they make these statements. The effect of substantial rights in this case is magnified by the majority's holding that under the counting of calumny, when the plaintiff shows anti-competitive effects but fails to show a less restrictive alternative to the defendant's pro-competitive justification, the court must balance the anti-competitive harms against the pro-competitive benefits. The district court did not undertake a formal calumny balancing analysis as such, although the majority concludes that the district court's analysis was sufficient. Remand for a formal balancing should be required. So the dissent largely agrees with the majority and its analysis, just disagrees that what mistakes the district court made were harmless to the ultimate determination of the case at issue. Now, as I mentioned at the top of this video, while the reports on this particular case determination appear to be a little bit more accurate than they were when the district court made its determination, as we can see here from IGN, Apple scores another win in, an, in epic antitrust dispute. I was made aware of this story on Game Refinery. Mobile game publishers are bypassing Google and Apple Store cuts with external web stores when the decision came down. And I thought that was interesting because, as you heard when going over the majority opinion, one of the things that the courts are really keen on paying attention to is whether or not Apple can get compensation for the use of its intellectual property, for access to its iOS ecosystem. And so folks that are just saying, well, if there's anti-steering rule injunction goes through, which it looks like it will based on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, then we can just send people off to the other part of the store and we don't owe Apple or Google anything, doesn't appear to be the case, right? So this is interesting if this is the notion that you can just send people outside the store and you don't owe Apple anything because the actual contract terms that you entered into with Apple suggest the opposite. So if we look at the DPLA, one of the things that happens is if you're going to use in-app purchases, if you're going to use the ecosystem in that specific way, you're sent to what's called Schedule 2. And if we look at Schedule 2, you agree that License applications shall include content, functionality, extensions, stickers, or services offered in a software application, and that further, Apple shall be entitled to the following commissions in consideration for its services as your agent and or commissioner under Schedule 2. For sales of licensed applications to end users, that includes content, that includes IAP, Apple shall be entitled to a commission equal to 30% of all prices payable by each user. So the way Apple currently has it structured, it has these contracts that say you owe it 30%, and then it has you only operating internally through their app ecosystem, and so they just collect their 30% off the top. But even if you go outside of their ecosystem, Apple doesn't get to see it necessarily, and it's harder for them to find the 30%, but contractually, legally, if you go through that process and send them off site, you still owe that 30% under the contracts you've otherwise agreed to. That can be challenged in the future for anything from anti-competitive effects to unconscionable contracts if you wanted to try. But as of right now, if you're a developer of an app on the App Store or even outside the App Store, you still owe the percentage that Apple has said that they get for their service as agent. Their distribution, they're, they're distributing the app for you. They're putting it in the store. They're doing those kinds of things. So these kinds of stories become very interesting because I do think tech in particular has a tendency to jump on legal cases, legal stories, and operate in a way that they think is appropriate. They are not allowed to prohibit steering now. And so you can steer, but they think that that gets them out of the cut. And that's a separate question. The cut itself hasn't been made illegal, hasn't been enjoined. And so this is going to come home to roost, I think, for a number of developers who operate in the manner suggested by this story. And I think that's an interesting aspect of this and other stories in the space. I also wanted to point out, as Tim Sweeney suggested in his tweet that we looked at earlier, Epic is having a lot more success outside of the antitrust litigation framework. We've talked about this in this space, but through the Coalition for App Fairness, through various other things at legislatures around the world, the Epic Game Store is having success in moving towards forcing Google and Apple to allow other stores and other access into their ecosystems. Here we see on a website called Mac Rumors, iOS 17, the next upgrade to the iOS operating system, is set to support app sideloading to comply with European regulations. Apple and iOS 17 will, for the first time, allow iPhone users to download apps hosted outside of its official app store, according to Bloomberg's Mark Gurman. Otherwise known as sideloading, the change would allow consumers to download apps without needing to use the app store, which would mean developers wouldn't need to pay Apple's 15 to 30 percent fees. You see the same kind of misconception here that we've seen in other reporting, and which I'm afraid gets to developers and are going to find themselves with a bill slash lawsuit in the future if they think that just using other means gets them out of what they've otherwise contractually agreed to give Apple for what the courts have found to be a licensing fee for the use of Apple's intellectual property.
The European Union's Digital Markets Act, the DMA, which went into effect November 1st, 2022, requires gatekeeper companies like Apple to open up their platforms to other companies and developers. The DMA will have a big impact on Apple's platforms, and it could result in Apple making major changes to the App Store, Messages, FaceTime, Siri, and more. Apple is planning to implement sideloading support to comply with the new European regulations by next year, according to German, and we may or may not find out about that at the Worldwide Developer Conference in June. That's really what that Bloomberg article was about. But it will be interesting to follow all of these kinds of changes to the Apple ecosystem and the Google ecosystem. And Tim Sweeney is not wrong. Epic is leading the charge to kind of force these companies to open through legislation instead of litigation, where we knew from the start that they really had a hard road to follow and that hasn't proven to be a lucrative one for them after the Ninth Circuit got done with the district court as of yesterday. So thank you so much for joining us here in an antitrust epic. I think this will probably be the last episode of the playlist, but I say that never knowing what will come next, who might appeal to the Supreme Court, whether the Supreme Court would take it up. They don't have to. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals is an appeal by right from the district court's finding. The Supreme Court in the United States is not something that you can appeal to by right. They have to accept your case as something interesting or useful that they can add their information to. Here, I think, is probably the end of the line for this case from my perspective as a United States lawyer but we'll see where it goes internationally and we will see as tim sweeney suggests whether or not europe and other jurisdictions continue to kind of crack open the ios slowly with laws rather than with litigation thank you so much for joining me and if you listen to this as a podcast thank you so much for listening and if you watch it on youtube thank you so much for watching i will catch you on the very next episode of virtual legality Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.